What is going on guys? The NFL has been around for over a century now, but the rule book has never been consistent. Throughout the years, amid public outcry, the league has tried improving its overall product by introducing new rules when the time calls for it. But some of the most important rules in today's NHL were inspired by their very own players. If it weren't for these guys, the game of hockey might look totally different from the sport that we all know and love today. So let's dive into it. Make sure to subscribe to TPS and put on your notifications. We post videos all the time, as you know, all the time. New videos every single day, really. And you know what? You should totally subscribe because it really helps us out. And we're trying to get to a million here. So let's get to a million. Number 18, Roger Nielsen rule. Okay, so he was actually not a player, but a bench boss who coached 1,000 games at the NHL level. He's best remembered for waving a white towel on a hockey stick to protest controversial officiating during a Vancouver Canucks Chicago Blackhawks playoff game. A statue of him hangs outside Rogers Arena in Vancouver to this day. During a game, he pulled his goalie to bring out the extra attacker, finding a loophole in the rule book. He informed his goalie to leave his stick in the crease, hoping it would save a potential goal. So the NHL responded by implementing a rule that barred goalies from leaving their sticks in the crease when the net was empty. Unfortunately, his genius tactic was fun while it lasted. Number 17, Sean Avery rule. The New York Rangers met the New Jersey Devils in the opening round of the 2008 playoffs. During game three, Rangers tough guy Sean Avery tried distracting goalie Martin Brodeur. He was waving his stick in the netminder's face repeatedly. It caused quite the ruckus, and Brodeur was understandably frustrated. The NHL cut down on this action immediately by introducing the Sean Avery rule. This new rule stated that players could be penalized if they try to distract the goalie by waving their arms or stick in his face. The Rangers won the series and Brodeur refused to shake Avery's hands in the post-game handshake line. Isn't hockey fun? Number 16, Bill Dernan. Goalies can't be captains. Montreal Canadiens legendary goalie and Hockey Hall of Famer Bill Dernan donned the captaincy for the 1947-48 season. As we all know, NHL captains have a responsibility to talk to referees if there's an incident. As well, if they have a question, if there's a controversial call, or, you know, whatever else. Well, opponents complained about Dernan's habit of leaving his net to talk to referees, which often took up ample amounts of time. Teams believed that he was simply trying to provide the Canadians with an unofficial timeout. So the league introduced the Bill Dernan rule, which barred goalies from being team captains. The Vancouver Canucks were granted an exception and named Robert Luongo their captain for the 08-09 season. However, he wasn't permitted to leave his crease like Dernan did. So the alternate captains would consult the referees instead. After two seasons, the Canucks had Luongo surrender his captaincy, and it was handed to franchise star Henrik Sedin instead. Number 15, Bill Barber and diving embellishment. The Hockey Hall of Famer guided the Philadelphia Flyers to a Stanley Cup victory in 1974 and 75. Bill Barber was renowned for his goal scoring abilities and enforcer role. The man also displayed phenomenal acting skills. Barber had a special talent in diving and selling minor contact. That is, he was able to draw penalties by ways of embellishing. Eventually, the NHL introduced Rule 64.1, which details that a player can be penalized for a blatant dive, embellishment, or feigning of an injury. Barber isn't necessarily the only reason the NHL implemented this rule, but his acting theatrics certainly forced the league's hand. Number 14, Gary Smith. Goalies can't cross center ice. The rulebook is so harsh on goalies. Former NHL goalie Gary Smith loved coming out to center ice, and he reportedly got drilled one time while trying this early in his professional career. Career. So the NHL introduced Rule 27.7, which details that if a goalie crosses the center ice line to check the opponent or play the puck, he'll be assessed a two-minute penalty. That didn't stop Patrick Waugh from trying it once. Number 13, Wayne Gretzky Edmonton Oilers Rule. The Oilers won five Stanley Cup championships between 1984 and 1990. The GOAT of hockey Wayne Gretzky was a member of the first four. The Oilers were stacked with Hall of Famers, including Glenn Anderson and Marc Messier. So the Oilers use an interesting tactic where they would start scuffles with other teams in hopes of drawing coincidental minors. By doing this, the Oilers would create three-on-three -three or four-on-four -four situations, leaving more open ice for their superstar players to play. It's actually pretty clever. Because Gretzky largely benefited from this, the pending rule was named after him. In 1985, the league changed the rule, where coincidental minors would still result in five-on-five -five play, rather than four-on-four -four or three-on-three. -three. Gretzky himself was very critical of the new rule, but it was scrapped for the 1992-93 season. Thing is, teams have been more wary of putting themselves in 4 on 4 or 3 on 3 situations now. Nobody wants to go to the penalty box for the sake of it. The brawling days of hockey are gone. Number 12, Bobby Hull and Stan Mikita. The banana blade curve. During the 60s, Chicago Blackhawks star Bobby Hull and Stan Mikita tried out different curves on their blades of their hockey sticks. They were looking for the right one. Finally, Hull and Mikita found the banana blade curve.
curve. They absolutely flourished with this new curve because when they shot the puck, it would have unpredictable movements. Thus, the goalies have a tough time reacting to it. They couldn't possibly guess where the puck was going. To no one's surprise, goalies became completely fed up with these curves, and rightfully so. Remember, not all goalies were wearing masks at the time, so they were worried about getting hit in the face with unpredictable shots. The NHL responded by issuing a legal limit on the curve of the blade. The limit is around half an inch to three quarters of an inch. If a player uses an illegal curve on their stick, they're hit with a two minute penalty. Number 11, Brett Hull, skate in the crease. The Dallas Stars clinched their first Stanley Cup in franchise history in 1999, when Brett Hull scored the game winner in overtime of game six against the Buffalo Sabres. However, Hull's skate was clearly in the crease when he scored the goal. At the time, NHL rules stated that a player can't be in the crease before the puck to score a goal. The NHL facing intense scrutiny and pressure abolished the skate in the crease rule. Essentially, players were now allowed to be in the crease when they scored as long as they didn't interfere with the goal. Thanks for getting that done, Brett. Number 10, Sergei Makarov. Called their trophy age requirements. Russian hockey legend Sergei Makarov came over to the NHL for the 1989-90 season as a 31-year-old. He scored 24 goals and 86 points for the Calgary Flames, winning the Calder Trophy, which is handed out annually to the league's top rookie. A 31-year-old winning the Calder Trophy. Uh, that just didn't seem right to anybody. This award is usually won by a player under the age of 21 after all. So the NHL implemented the Sergei Makarov rule, which means players have to be under 26 years of age to be eligible for the Calder Trophy. Number nine, Rob Ray rule. When it came to enforcers, few of them were as physically punishing as Rob Ray. This man compiled a whopping 3,270 penalty minutes throughout his career. It's kind of a lot. Why did Ray win so many of his fights? He would quickly remove his jersey and shoulder pads, thus making it difficult for the opponent to get a proper handle on him. It gave Ray a huge advantage. The Rob Ray rule details that a player will be assessed a game misconduct if his sweater is completely removed during a fight, unless his opponent is responsible for pulling it off. It also outlined that all players must have their jerseys tied down properly. Number eight, Matt Cook rule. During a 2010 game against the Boston Bruins, Pittsburgh Penguins tough guy Matt Cook hit Mark Savard straight in the head, which resulted in a concussion for the latter. Somehow Cook avoided the penalty, and the NHL didn't even find him despite the ugly and gutless move. Concussions plagued Savard for the remainder of his career, and he had to retire early. Ahead of the 2010-11 season, the NHL introduced Rule 48, better known as the Matt Cook Rule. It outlines the following. Illegal checks to the head, defined as a lateral or blindside hit to an opponent, where the head is targeted and or the principal point of contact is not permitted. Otherwise, a player will be subject to a five minute penalty plus a game misconduct, as well as a possible suspension. And there you have it, Matt Cook's contribution to the NHL. Number seven, Rejo Ruazza. Lining. The St. Louis Blues tried signing both Kyle Wellwood and Marek Svatos during the 2010-11 season, but they were claimed off waivers by the San Jose Sharks and Nashville Predators. So the Blues struck out on both. Why is this? Well, both players had started out the season in the KHL in Russia. By rule, if a player starts the season out overseas, and if an NHL team signs him, the player must pass through waivers first. Rejo Ruotsalainen is responsible for that rule. During the Edmonton Oilers 80s dynasty days, Ruotsalainen and would split time between Europe and the NHL. And he joined the Oilers late in the 1987 season to help them win the Stanley Cup. So the NHL implemented the new system where a player coming from overseas to the NHL must pass through waivers before a team can sign him. Sorry, Blues. Blame Rejo. Number six, Tony Esposito's web between the pads. Tony Esposito is widely regarded as one of the greatest goalies in NHL history. He was also one of the more innovative players ever. In 1969, Esposito cleverly sewed a web made of elastic mesh between his goalie pads in order to protect the five hole. In one instance, the web stopped a puck, and it nearly bounced back to hit the shooter right in the face. Not surprisingly, Esposito didn't get too used to his five hole web for long. The NHL banned it shortly after, meaning he actually had to use his own skills to prevent the pucks from getting through his legs. Number five, Martin Brodeur, the trapezoid rule. Martin Brodeur and the New Jersey Devils were virtually impossible to score on during their near two decade run of dominance. They reached the Stanley Cup final five times and won it all in 1995, 2003. Brodeur also won two Olympic gold medals with Team Canada and holds the records for most career wins and shutouts. Brodeur was also an elite puck handler in his own end. When the puck came into New Jersey's end, Brodeur would come out and get the puck before opposing teams could get to it. The NHL wanted to introduce more offense, and for the 05-06 season, following the 04-05 lockout, they introduced the Martin Brodeur rule. The league simply placed a trapezoid area behind the net, where goalies can play 
play the puck. If they play the puck from outside that trapezoid area, it's a two minute penalty. Sorry, Marty, you were just too good at hockey and it made the league angry. So they had to take a major bite out of your dominant style of play. Number four, Ted Lindsay, the elbowing penalty. The Detroit Red Wings legend and hockey hall of famer was nicknamed Terrible Ted for a reason. He wasn't the biggest guy on the ice, but Lindsay absolutely punished opponents with his physical style of play. Lindsay loved dishing out hits with his knees and elbows. So the NHL introduced the kneeing and elbowing penalties, thus scrapping a page from Lindsay's book. It still didn't stop him from becoming the hockey icon that everybody came to know and love. Number three, Jean Beliveau. Minor penalty rule changes. In the olden days, if an NFL player committed a two minute penalty, he had to serve the entire 120 seconds, no matter what. But the Montreal Canadiens, a dynasty in the 50s, were virtually unstoppable on the power play. In a November 5th, 1955 game against the Boston Bruins, this guy scored four goals. Three of them came on one power play within 44 seconds. Yes, this power play was unstoppable. So for the 56-57 season, the NHL changed the rule so a player's two minute penalty would be over if an opponent scores on the power play. The rule still applies in today's NHL. Although, players do need to serve the entirety of a penalty if it's a five minute major, regardless of how many goals are scored. Number two, Clint Benedict. Goalies can go down. In the olden days of hockey, goalies weren't allowed to go down to make a save. They simply had to stand up the entire game. But Benedict would apparently pretend that he fell down to make a save. Eventually, the NHL passed a rule that allowed goalies to leave his skates and go down to make a save. Because he went down so often to stop the puck, Benedict earned the nickname Praying Benny. Let's just say every goalie to ever live has to be thankful for Benedict. It'd be practically impossible to play the position today if you were forced to stand up the entire time. Number one, Jacques Plante. Goalie masks mandatory. Canadian's goalie Jacques Plante tried wearing a goalie mask earlier in his career, but head coach Toe Blake, can't believe his name is Toe, wouldn't permit it. I mean, where's the original? parents. 1950s, weird time. He worried it would obstruct his ability to see and track the play. On November 1st, 1959, Plant suffered a broken nose when a shot hit him right in the face. Plant got stitched up and refused to step back in the crease unless his coach would allow him to wear the mask. Blake reluctantly agreed. The Canadians would go on a hot streak and capture the Stanley Cup in 1960. So Blake had no reason to argue. Not all goalies wore masks during the Plant days, but over time, more and more of them adopted it. Andy Brown was the last goalie to ever play in an NHL game without a mask in 1974. Of course, goalie masks are now mandatory. And my God, are all hockey goalies today ever thankful that Plant stood his ground until his mission was accomplished? What other NHL players are responsible for rule changes? Join me in the comment section below. Make sure to follow myself at TPS on social media. I make TikToks. It's my new thing. Love doing it. So go follow me on TikTok. Subscribe to TPS because we post videos every single day. Every day is a new video. Why would you not want new sports content every single day? It's honestly a really good idea. Subscribe. Make sure to like the video right next to the subscribe button. It's right down there. That little thumbs up. Help us out. Of course, thank you so so much for watching. I'm Jason Biondo. I'll see you next time. My knee.